Good morning. Welcome to the uh, Military Strategy Forum here at CSIS. My name is Kim Wincup. I'm the least interesting person on the panel, but we've got a great panel for you this morning. Um, this is the Military Strategy Forum where CSIS, for the past couple of years, has been hosting the most senior leadership of the Department of Defense, the combatant commanders, the chiefs, uh, the people that are really making the def decisions about our nation's defense. And uh, they've been terrific dialogues. And I want to thank, on behalf of CSIS, uh, Rolls Royce, who's been enormously helpful to be the sponsor of this. I know General Steve Plummer's with us this morning. Uh, we thank you very much, and we thank Rolls Royce for his continuing support. Um, these sessions take a lot of preparation. There have been a lot of there's a lot of people working on. It. I want to mention two: Lieutenant Colonel Dan Bilko, who's a military fellow here at CSIS from the Guard, and Terrence Smith, who makes it all happen to get puts it together. We're privileged today to have General Craig McKinley who's Chief of the National Guard Bureau with us. Um, he is the first four-star Chief of the National Guard Bureau. He's not going to like me to say this, and it's possible, I would say it's actually probable that he's the next member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, he's accompanied... <laughs> now he's really not going to like that I said it. Um, he's accompanied by Lieutenant General Bud Wyatt, who's the Director of the Air National Guard. General Wyatt has a distinguished career in the Air Force and as a lawyer. Um, he's an SMU grad. That'll become more relevant in a moment. Um, and he was formerly the TAG of Oklahoma. We also have Major General Tim Cadavy, who's the Deputy Director of the Army National Guard. Um, two re relatively recent deployments to Bosnia and, and Iraq in his background, and then was the, the TAG of Nebraska. Um, He's also breaking in a new director, a newly confirmed director of the Army National Guard, so we very much appreciate your both being with us. And with your understanding, I'm going to sort of limit my discussion of your backgrounds and, and uh, force, only force General McKinley to sit through it, mm -hmm. given he's our presenter. Um, General McKinley joined the Air Force through ROTC at SMU, the relevant point. Uh, he was a distinguished military graduate there in, in, when he joined in 1974, 37 years of service and counting. Um, he's had extensive service all over the Air Force as a pilot, 4,000 hours in almost every aircraft that you can imagine. Um, he's been to European command, and he's served on, in a wide variety of positions in the, in the air staff. Two master's degrees. He's been at senior leadership uh, courses at Harvard, the Maxwell School at Syracuse, the, creative, the Center for Creative Leadership in Colorado Springs, uh, a fabulous background. Most recently, he became the director of the Air National Guard in 2006 and then was selected by the President and Secretary Gates to be the Chief of the National Guard Bureau in November of 2008. As Chief, he has really one of the most interesting and unique charters in the, in the department. Now, let me just read a part of it. He's the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense through the Chairman on National Guard matters. He's the principal advisor to the Secretary and Chief of both the Army and the Air Force. He's the Department's official channel of communication with the Governors and the Adjutant Generals of all the states. And he's also, also in his spare time, he's responsible for the well-being of almost a half million guardsmen. Now let me be just slight, less serious for, for a moment. Um, he's also, a tr by all accounts, he's a terrific golfer and could have been a, on the Pro Tour if he had chosen that, uh, <laughs> chosen that path. One of his close friends mentions that he's particularly fond of Klondike bars, um, partly due to the, your potential golf career and also because it's breakfast. We didn't have any here for you this morning, but, uh, um, but it's a good thought. Uh, he's flown aircraft in the Guard uh, inventory of all kinds, dating back, frankly, to ones that were developed in the 1940s. I understand his call sign is Mustang, which is either relevant to his SMU background or has something to do with a an aircraft that uh, he, f he must have flown way back when. Wish to have flown. Wish to have flown. <laughs> well, either way, uh, General McKinley and the, and the National Guard are at the center of the nation's security. Uh, they've been involved in, uh, critically involved in deployments and, and the two wars of the past 10 years. And, uh, and it's not just that. They've been involved in domestic issues uh, that have served this country uh, well in, in critical situations for the past couple of years. And maybe more importantly for our discussion this morning, they're going to be knee-deep in the major defense decisions that are coming in this country with respect to this enormously important drawdown that we're about to face. So, General McKinley, we are thrilled to have you with us this morning and, and look forward to your comments. Thanks, Jim. 
Thank you all. Well, good morning. Thanks for uh, coming out on this uh, blustery morning. Uh, it feels like winter's finally arrived. Uh, it's great to be with you today. I didn't know whether it was the free breakfast or the uh, uh, folks next to me who are going to speak today what, that brought you out, but I'm, I'm pleased that you're here. Uh, there is a lot going on, obviously, uh, around the world. Kim, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I will get even with the person who provided you those thoughts behind the scene. Uh, paybacks are heck. You know how that goes. To my former boss, Steve Wood, who was over there, I came back from Europe and went in as a deputy A-8 uh, for the Air Force. Uh, great to see you, General Plummer. Thanks for uh, you and your, your uh, company sponsoring this. I know you've got a bunch of your colleagues in the room. Thanks. This gives us a chance to share uh, some current events with you all. Uh, and to hear what's on your mind today. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Dr. Hamry's a personal hero of mine, and, and I'm sorry he's not here today, but please extend my uh, warmest regards to Dr. Hamry. Uh, it's important, I think, for us today, uh, just before the Thanksgiving holiday, to, to stop and think a little bit about uh, what your National Guard is doing for you. Um, sometimes when we're out in the states and the territories, some of the criticism of us in Washington is, is we don't tell our story very well. And quite frankly, uh, that's a, that's a uh, rap that many of our organizations hear, is that senior leaders don't tell their story very well. So uh, when I had the opportunity to accept this invitation, uh, I wanted to bring the enterprise with me. And you're getting the majority of the enterprise here with, with General Wyatt, our director of our Air Guard, and Tim Cadavy, our deputy director of the Army Guard. That's that's the bulk of our major operation, but we have another player, uh, Randy Manor, who's our director of our joint staff. And my predecessor, Steve Blum, created a joint staff within the Bureau because a post-Katrina uh, presentation of forces demands that we have a joint staff now. So getting our organization right was, was a huge part of my predecessor's uh, role as the chief, the 25th chief. I'm the 26th chief, and, and quite frankly, that was part of my goal, too, was to get continue to mature the organization of the National Guard Bureau so that we can do the things that uh, Kim Wincup told you about. Uh, I've got a few prepared remarks, but really the importance of today is to hear what's on your mind, to answer your questions. Uh, I see many friends in the room, so I don't expect any hardballs from anybody I have pictures of here. Uh, but uh, it's great, great to have the opportunity to be here. Just, just as an aside, yeah, Bud and I are SMU grads. We didn't know each other at the time. Bud's a little older than me. I hope you don't mind me saying that. And, uh, and, and, and Bud had a different plan. Bud was an all-star quarterback playing football in Oklahoma. So to go to SMU back then and even today, uh, it costs a, a few bucks to go to that school. So you don't go there unless, uh, unless you're independently wealthy. So Bud gets an athletic scholarship, full ride, you know, the whole deal. Eats at the, eats at the athletic table, eats steaks every night. And I go through on an ROTC scholarship, a little different gig. So Bud graduates after being an all-star, you know, football player, quarterback of the team. Um, nobody knew me, obviously. Uh, I get to go to flight school. Bud goes to 90 days of OTS, and he goes to flight school. And now look at us. I don't know who made the right choice, but, <laughs> but uh, then we rendezvous later in our careers. And uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of neat. Tim, I don't have any stories on you. I hope you don't mind. All right. Thanks again for all the senior people here former uh, flag and general officers. It's great to have you in the room today. Um, as many of you know, uh, next month on December 13th, uh, we mark our 375th birthday. That kind of aggravates some of my fellow service chiefs because the United States Army is our senior service. But when I tell them that we're 375 years old, they roll their eyes and go, yeah, sure. Because they said we weren't a nation before then. And quite frankly, uh, that's the beauty of the National Guard is before we were a nation, uh, we had folks, immigrants, who came to our shores who decided to form bands of people to protect themselves. And that's kind of the early genesis. So over those 375 years, the National Guard has played a significant role in maintaining peace and security for our nation and for our individual states, uh, the three territories of Guam, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico, and here in the District of Columbia. And I'm very proud of the rich heritage and of the present day resolve uh, as we continue our role in the preservation of the ideals upon which our country was established. Uh, today we're faced with a historic opportunity as we stand at the confluence of a new fiscal environment and the transition from combat to stability operations. 
Uh, this convergence is leading to new defense-wide budgetary realities, which I hope we'll get into some debate with as we get into questions and answers, and challenging our decision makers as they formulate difficult spending choices that are both sustainable and capable of keeping the American people safe and secure. The global security environment can be characterized as an era of persistent conflict. In fact, my good friend George Casey, I think, coined that line, in which asymmetric threats, and anybody who heard me last week, I couldn't get asymmetric out, so I'm going to say asymmetric in every speech I get from now on, in which asymmetric threats continue to pose a danger to the United States. In light of this, we must remain vigilant. The United States faces greater security challenges today than at the end of the Cold War, which was the last time the military was significantly restructured. And obviously, after every recent global conflict, our military has gone down about 20 to 25 to 30 percent in their overall budget uh, after every major conflict. The past 10 years of military conflict has led to vast improvements in manpower, training, and equipment. The National Guard, no exception there. We've benefited greatly from United States Army, United States Air Force planning and programming for us. This reality, combined with significant combat experience, has created what could be called a war dividend, uh, especially for the National Guard. We now have the most capable, accessible, and battle-tested National Guard in the history of the United States. Now, some of our folks who fought in World War II, the last time the National Guard was fully mobilized, might argue with that. And, I, and this is an arg arguably tough comment to make, because I've met some of these uh, greatest generation folks. Uh, but I make that comment today because of the great integration that we have with both of our services. By capitalizing on the investment made in the National Guard, this organization can arise as one of the best options available as our nation strives to concurrently preserve military capability while decreasing overall defense expenditures. As, an as-needed force, nearly 85% of the National Guard is part-time. National Guard members cost approximately one-third that of their active duty counterparts, especially when we're not mobilized. National Guard appropriations account for less than 7% of DOD appropriations. National Guardsmen and women serve longer and retire later than their active duty counterparts, and that retirement costs one-tenth of the active duty. So those, those are facts that we present to you. We can debate them. And, and quite frankly, I, I, I think those are facts that have to be substantiated by people other than ourselves. So I welcome that, too. Um, in the domestic support arena, we are always forward deployed and we're community based. Um, we believe that time and distance equals American lives. I think we saw that during Hurricane Katrina. Guardsmen and women live in nearly every zip code and have units located in more than 3,000 communities in every state and the territories and the district. 96% of all emergencies in the United States are handled by civil authorities or the National Guard. That's just a statistic that's out there today. A myriad of response capabilities that the National Guard possesses. We have domestic all hazards response teams. We have Homeland Response Forces that were created in the recent QDR. We have chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and high-yield explosive enhanced response force packages. You'll hear, hear those referred to as surf peas. Uh, we have the National Guard Reaction Force. That's a very small footprint, but can rapidly deploy in support of first responders like police and fire. Uh, we have 57 weapons of mass destruction civil support teams uh, that are out there full-time at the disposal of the governors and our National Command Authority to try to ascertain uh, various substances that may pop up. And General Wyatt will talk about what we used to call uh, Air Sovereignty Alert, but which is now called Aerospace Control Alert, ACA. In natural disasters, which we've had 10 major disasters this year, each costing a billion dollars or more, that Craig Fugate has had the tough job of getting out and managing for the President. Uh, we handle floods. Uh, Hurricane Irene was our most recent large-scale natural disaster that potentially could have hit 17 or 18 states along the coast, and it really took, uh, so, took site on the northeast. Snowstorms, wildfires, and we have this thing since September 11, 2001 called Protection of Civil Infrastructure. Uh, we've got teams on the southwest border, and we participate in counter drug programs. Uh, and then we're intimately involved with all our national special security events, NSSEs, uh, the APEC Summit being the most recent. We've got about eight or 10 more NSSEs on the horizon running out through the inauguration in 2013. 
In overseas defense operations, uh, we provide critical operational components to both the Army and the Air Force in their warfighting or Title X missions. Uh, we have about 55,000 soldiers, which General Cadaby will talk about, available each year to the combatant commanders. Uh, and since September 11, 2001, National Guard citizen soldiers and airmen have been mobilized more than 700,000 times in support of the overseas missions in Iraq and Afghanistan and domestic missions, some more than once. More than half of National Guard members are combat veterans today. Today, there are roughly 55,000 Guard members currently activated as of this morning. Uh, and General Wyatt will talk about some of the new missions that the Air Force has transitioned to the Air National Guard. Uh, one of our uh, new preeminent organizations is the MQ-9 Squadron up in Syracuse. In the global environment, uh, we believe that when you leverage the blend of civilian acquired military skills, uh, you take soldiers and airmen to places like Kosovo, the Horn of Africa, and the Sinai that can really make a difference by integrating with those local populations. We've got some experts in the room here who can talk about the state partnership program. It includes more than 60 military to military partnerships with foreign nations. And I know some of the attaches were scheduled to be here and I welcome you here today. Now, this state partnership program costs about $14 million per year. Uh, and what does it result in, other than a lot of goodwill and building partnership capacity? Today we have 22 state partnership program nations which provide 11,000 troops in Afghanistan. And those are 11,000 troops that we don't have to provide. We have things called the Agribusiness Development Teams, ADTs. They're a self-contained team of 58 Army and Air National Guardsmen with expertise in various sectors of the agribusiness fields. I know General Cadavy can talk extensively as a former Adjutant General in Nebraska about how important those uh, agribusiness development teams have been in Afghanistan. Uh, the ADT members bring their military capabilities as well as their professional civilian sk skills and education in various agricultural disciplines to work directly with the farmers in Afghanistan. I didn't realize it, but Nebraska has the largest Afghan population in the United States, and uh, they're partnered very closely with the civilian schools in Nebraska. Since 2008, 31 of those teams have operated in 15 provinces and contributed almost 600 agricultural product projects, generating more than $31 million in economic benefits for Afghan citizens. Interagency relationships aimed at global stabi stability and prosperity, including our very close relationships with FEMA and the State Department, are critical skill sets that have been developed in the National Guard over the last 10 years. Seven states provided support to Operation Tomodachi after the large earthquake uh, in Japan and the tsunami. Uh, the Louisiana National Guard led New Horizon Haiti 2011, a collaborative effort to rebuild and renovate school buildings and operate medical treatment sites. And this one, some of you may not know, but I think it's an amazing uh, mission for all of us. Uh, using specially equipped LC-130s, New York Air Guard members completed 374 missions in Antarctica, carrying 2,400 passengers and 8.1 million pounds of cargo and fuel in support of Operation Deep Freeze, the U.S. military's support of science and research activities. That entire new site at the South Pole was resupplied by LC-130s from New York. The most important part of our whole enterprise are our people, soldiers, airmen, and our families. Um, we have a very diverse, a very capable, and a very healthy workforce. More than 80% of our citizen soldiers in the Army National Guard joined the military after September 11, 2001. Uh, our warrior transition units, which Tim can talk to, uh, have community basing, uh, and they provide support for over 600 Army National Guard soldiers in positions at all levels of the organization from squad leader to battalion commander. We're heavily involved in resilience, risk reduction, and suicide, which I know we'll probably get some questions on, and then a whole list of family support programs, which many of you have heard, such as Yellow Ribbon, employer support, sexual assault prevention and response, psychological health, uh, warrior support, family assistance centers, youth programs to include a program called Youth Challenge, which is a very effective uh, program in our, in our states that affect uh, about 110,000 young men and women who've actually gotten their high school degree and star base at our Air Guard bases. So in closing, uh, the National Guard's prepared to respond to our country's budgetary crisis and to help maintain our national security. The new fiscal realities facing the Department of Defense offer an opportunity to review not only what the National Guard has contributed 
over the past decade, but equally, if not more importantly, where the National Guard will be 10 years from now. One of the things that I'm, I'm most pleased with is Secretary Panetta has come into the building and uh, Chairman Dempsey, General Marty Dempsey, has said we have to design a military that will function and be capable in the year 2020. It's hard to look out that far, especially with the threats that we have today, and say what kind of military do we need? But our task, the task of the gentleman in front of you and our adjutants general, which are really out on the tip of the spear for our National Guard, is what does the National Guard need to do to get to 2020? And how can it be the most effective and efficient force to support our Air Army and our Air Force and our governors uh, 8 to 10 to 15 years from now? The Guard has reaffirmed its value to our parent services, to our states, and to the nation as an operational force. There is cost to being operational, however, and we will continue as a strategic hedge. Now we must embrace the opportunity at hand, and we must make our case in the building, in the Pentagon, that we are relevant, capable, accessible, and a fully integrated component of the United States Army and Air Force as we prepare for future threats at home and abroad. I thought this would be interesting. I took this out of Gordon Sullivan's September 2010 uh, white paper. He said, I quote, the Guard and Reserve are at a crossroads. Down one path lies continued transformation into a 21st century <clears throat> operational force and progress on planning budgetary and management reform still required to make that aspiration a reality. Down the other path lies regression to a Cold War style strategic force meant only to be used as a last resort in the event of major war. General Sullivan is absolutely accurate in that pivot point in our nation's history. I look forward to your questions, as does General Wyatt, General Cadaby. Uh, Kim, I'll turn it back over to you to moderate. Thank you for the opportunity to make those brief remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. There's a, there's a method here at CSIS for the question process because we're being webcast. So I'm going to, Terrence, and there's another gentleman in the back who have microphones. So a, as you get recognized for questions, please wait for a moment so we can get a microphone in your hand so everybody can hear your question. Questions? Well, Greg, in your second. Greg Kiley with uh, CSIS. General, you mentioned um, having to independently substantiate your own numbers. Do you have a plan for that? We've, uh, we've asked within the building, and uh, the closest thing we've had recently is the Office of Secretary of Defense Reserve Affairs under Denny McCarthy. He and the former vice chairman did, a, did an analysis. Um, I, think, I think what all of us would approve and want is, is to have a very thoughtful, forceful look done by uh, Rand or, or another agency in town that can verify. Because what we're facing, I think, in the building is people saying, well, you know, these last 10 years when we mobilized 60,000 soldiers, this is a very expensive force. Uh, that's looking at a small snapshot in time. Uh, I would like uh, cradle to grave, day from enlistment till the day we retire, then our retirement fees to be looked at. And I don't think we've ever done that. And so I'm encouraging the department and others to say, let's once and for all put the numbers on the table, let's, let's verify, and let's make sure that when we say a member of the Guard costs 25 or 30 percent over the lifetime of that member, that we're really talking apples to apples, and not just during this very uh, intense period of combat that we've been through these last 10 years. So hopefully we can get there. Uh, I'd be willing to put some of our money up to do it, uh, because I think it's important for our nation, and especially the people in this town, to understand that we're just not pulling those numbers out of thin air. Sometimes that happens, and I think uh, former Chief Casey says when you go through these very tough budgetary environments, that's when the tension arises, and so we really have to have accurate data to, to speak from. Thanks. I'm Michael Bosworth. I'm uh, the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of Naval Sea Systems Command um, and also a reserve. Um, my question is, uh, I've been on the uh, Flag or Oversight Board for Task Force Climate Change, which uh, is looking particularly at the uh, warming of the Arctic over the next uh, 20 years and the opening of 
navigation and economic opportunities there in a very vast and uh, desolate region with very little infrastructure. Um, I'm curious uh, to, to any of the three uh, generals here, uh, what uh, has been a National Guard uh, response uh, to that, or how do you see that that might affect your planning for the next 10 or 20 years? I'll, I'll just kick it off and then turn it over to uh, the folks who work with the services on this. Um, obviously, uh, United States Northern Command, now Chuck Jacoby, formerly Sandy Winterfield, and I have had preliminary discussions. Opening this whole area up is going to be vitally important to the United States and to our great neighbors to the North Canada. So this is kind of a binational issue, but I think both services are doing a lot behind the scenes, uh, not only looking at, at uh, climate change globally, but also looking at uh, fuel conservation, biofuels, and things like that that I think are very important to our future. Uh, our equipment is the same equipment as the Army and the Air Force uses, so whatever plans uh, that our parent services can put on the table is what we will adopt. Uh, but each state, too, I think, has got, have got some very significant investments uh, in energy conservation, uh, biofuels, wind farms, things like that, that I'll let Bud and Tim talk about individually. Thanks. Uh, from, from the Air National Guard side of the House, General McKinley touched on the, uh, the fact that we share uh, the same types of equipment flying uh, with the active component. Air Mobility Command has uh, really led the way in the fuel efficiencies uh, initiatives that they have, taking a look at uh, loads, fuel loads, uh, cargo loads, routes. There are some new routes that are opening up uh, over the poles that uh, uh, certainly cut down the time and fuel usage. Uh, and we work hand in hand with Air Mobility Command, uh, not only in saving fuel, but in the conversion from uh, petroleum-based to uh, other based uh, fuels, you know, the, the green fleet, if you will. Uh, locally, uh, what we're finding and uh, pushing in the Air National Guard, we have uh, 88 wings across uh, all 50 states, Guam, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia. And uh, what we sometimes forget is that there are a lot of solutions out there that are not necessarily federal solutions. When we work with the adjutants general and we work with some of the resources within the respective states, we can find some efficiencies in the operation of our, of our bases. Um, <clears throat> incentives at the state level uh, for uh, wind farms, for uh, solar energy, uh, anything that can save, uh, uh, save uh, energy, save costs, make us more efficient. And that's the beauty of, uh, uh, of working with the 54 adjutants general is because uh, within each state there are different uh, paradigms, different opportunities, and if you leverage <coughs> what works uh, across uh, several states with others, uh, you, you really get the best of breed. And so we're concentrating not only uh, looking for the federal solution, but looking for the state solution as we uh, focus on the efficiencies that our bases can provide. Yeah, yes, sir. I'll, uh, I'll just give two examples or, or two comments. First, as we build new armories, training sites, uh, essentially any facility, uh, we take the, uh, the best of, of energy conservation into mind as we build those and they're, they're put into the, the architecture and the engineering of our new Milcon projects. So that's for the future. Uh, the other thing, recently the Army announced a net zero program where uh, they identified some, some target installations um, that will work on reducing the footprint in energy, water, and waste. And we've, the Army selected and, and we support the, the state of Oregon who will have a special project uh, for water and then they're also going to be our state that shows ways and comes up with ideas that we can apply to the other 54 states, territories, and District of Columbia of how to reduce the footprint uh, to net zero if possible possible, but to, to lower our, our energy, water, and waste footprint to the lowest level possible. Just my final comment, maybe you have a redirect, but uh, we had uh, two of our uh, governors in town this week as they started their journey to Afghanistan to visit soldiers. It was <clears throat> Governor Markell from uh, Delaware and Governor Malloy from Connecticut. And what I was struck with, I had lunch with Dr. Paul Stockton, uh, and the Assistant Secretary uh, is looking at how we would resupply uh, the generators during a large-scale civilian uh, crisis here at home. And both governors said there's extensive uh, commercial uh, investment and study done in their home states, obviously, on fuel cell 
and other issues. And so I, I, think, uh, I think for us, we really need to push away from the, the DCAOR and find out what is the best product, what is going on out in the fields, and use our uh, state-based organizations to bring us the best of breed so we can stay on the leading edge of this. But I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the question. Thanks. Let me get two other questions pre-positioned and then take advantage of that opportunity and ask one myself. The gentleman right here. Okay, and we'll, uh, we'll do the next in a moment. Sir, if you don't mind, um, take advantage of the chance to be moderator. You've talked about some wonderful things that have been going on in the Guard and, and its performance, um, but could you and the directors talk about an issue that's been uh, discussed pretty widely recently here in Washington about uh, unemployment for service folks after they come off. It, it presents a unique problem for the Guard because in many cases, probably in most, your folks when they get mobilized are coming from a civilian occupation and then are going to go serve the country. And, and there are unfortunate reports about the numbers that are going on. Could you give us an idea what the situation is and kind of what some thoughts on what might be done to make it better? Well, we'll start at the beginning. Our, our recruiting and retention is, is doing exceedingly well, and, and I attribute that to, to young people wanting to serve, their preponderance to serve, but also that this is a very tough economy today. Um, and so we've got young people who will leave in the Army's case for a 12-month uh, boots on the ground, uh, or in the Air Guard case, multiple deployments for shorter periods of time, and they're coming home and finding themselves uh, out of work and uh, not having much success. Uh, we think our statistics uh, uh, are much like active component statistics, but maybe a little higher in some of the areas of the country that we would, uh, we would say in the upper Midwest, the manufacturing areas of, of, this, of the country where, where we've seen some units as high as 21 to 25 percent unemployment when they return. Uh, those are unacceptable to us and they're unacceptable to our leaders in the field. Um, the President obviously has set a pretty high mark on, on getting vets back into work and he's done some magnificent things. The Secretary of Defense has spoken to the subject uh, and our adjutants general with their governors have done an awful lot. Have we turned the trend uh, the other way? Not quite yet and uh, I think it's going to have to take a combination of effects of m many of the large employers are going to have to understand that these are some of the finest people you would ever want working for you. Uh, and and uh, they bring all the great skills back from their military training. Uh, but we owe our vets uh, a, a job when they get home. Employer support of the Guard and Reserve, I'll throw out a, a, a thanks to them. Uh, uh, we, we couldn't do our work without them. They, they arbitrate. They are the ombudsman who, who prevent any kind of uh, breaks in law or faith. But beyond that, we've got to continue to pursue programs uh, out there individually in the states to try to get this trend turned around. I, I know uh, Tim will, will cover uh, the Army and, and Bud the Air, but I, I will throw a thank you out to Jack Stoltz in the Army Reserve. He's done a magnificent job in the Army Reserve creating programs that have helped his folks. So again, uh, we'll take any great ideas, and, but it is a significant problem, and we've got to deal with it and try to, try to turn the trend around. Bud? I think General McKinley's uh, touched on uh, most of the uh, the points uh, in the Air Guard. Uh, I think because of the shorter length of time uh, of our deployments, uh, the, although the issue is significant, unemployment is significant. Uh, perhaps not as significant as uh, in the Army National Guard. <clears throat> when you take a look at uh, most of our forces, uh, especially in the RPA arena and, and some of the other uh, stress skill sets. Uh, we don't anticipate uh, a lot of uh, retrenchment coming uh, back home from Iraq or Afghanistan because if you'll think back a little bit, uh, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, coming out of uh, uh, Desert Storm, and I guess it was 20 years ago, boy, that was fun, hmm. uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the requirement to, uh, uh, to con continue air presence forward, uh, we anticipate we're still going to be uh, uh, rotating in and out of theater uh, to provide uh, the type of uh, forward presence that uh, that are required by the Air Force, uh, but we uh, we work uh, very closely again with the adjutants general because we're finding that a lot of the unemployment is not necessarily due to service in the military, but due to local economies and the demographics in those particular areas. And so the the adjutants general and the uh, resources available at the state level are the first line of defense. But I'll tell you that the initiatives that the president has uh, 
has instituted, uh, the great work of employer support garden reserve, some of the programs that we have in, the yellow ribbon transition programs that help with uh, finding jobs are all things that are working. They're not complete solutions, but they are making a positive impact on addressing that problem. Well, I don't have much more to add. Uh, General McKinley, General White uh, covered most of the, the key issues. I, I just say from the Army Guard perspective, we continue to partner uh, with those businesses that, uh, that are interested in veterans and Army National Guard uh, uh, soldiers as, as their employees. Uh, many, of this, many of the things we look for in soldiers, they also look for in employees, uh, committed, dedicated, uh, drug-free, uh, and understand some, something about leadership and, and et cetera. Uh, so we partner with, with those uh, at the national level, the larger corporations, but I'll, I'll just uh, continue the comment that General Wyatt said is, you know, my experience in Nebraska, we had many of the local and smaller businesses in the area that we contacted and we would help facilitate uh, those that were looking with jobs, looking for jobs with those that uh, in, in the state of Nebraska that had, had openings. And I think that was uh, very productive. You know, Kim, this has been a personal concern of mine. The high tempo that the Guard has experienced, both on the Air Guard side and the Army Guard side, has created a condition where uh, many of our soldiers and airmen have, have turned to the Guard almost for full-time employment. Uh, that's a phenomena that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Uh, gets back to the value piece. And as we unwind this force from, from predominantly uh, high tempo, high deployed force, uh, many deployed uh, twice, three times, to back to our traditional uh, 70, 30, 85 uh, percent uh, part time, uh, we've got to figure out a way to get us back into that balanced structure. And this unemployment issue will, will be with us for a few years, I'm afraid. So we've got to tackle it head on and, and we've got to transition the bulk of the force back from combat, uh, back to uh, citizen, soldier, and airman, and that's going to take some some really uh, uh, strong coordination with our with our adjutants general and the governors. Uh, general McKinley, Rich Green from Nogus. Uh, you know, given the information that you presented uh, as to all the things that the guard uh, has done, our capabilities and our value and cost effectiveness, uh, we often hear from the active component that we're not accessible. Uh, most of us in the guard would clearly say that that's an invalid uh, response on their part. But what's what are we? How are we doing with changing the perceptions of the active component as to our accessibility? The lawyers in the room would talk about the authorities that are given to the building to access guardsmen and reservists to do appropriate operations, and there's legislation on the floor now to take a look at that to give to give more authority inside the building to to tackle that. Um, I will certainly let my colleagues address their specific services, but um, I think it, it's been a traditional cultural issue with our services that uh, it's a hard thing to do to get a guardsman. Um, it may go back to the 70s, I don't know, but we've got to break that uh, mindset that governors might for some reason not allow their guardsmen and women to participate. We've not seen that, and uh, I think Bud and, and, and Tim both can tell you that there's a uh, I don't know of one mission we've turned down. Now, I know they, they send their soldiers and airmen a little differently. They mobilize a unit or they volunteer to send units. Uh, but, but that's something we've got to tackle. I think we're making progress with it. I know the Army and the Air Force understands uh, the dilemma, but it's still brought up in many circles that we, don't, we're not, we can't commit to integrating the Guard because we don't know if we'll have access to them. It's a big issue. But... I think, uh, you know, General McKinley touched on the authorities part. If you, if you look at the statutes that allow uh, mobilization in certain circumstances, there are plenty of authorities out there. I think there's some pending legislation, uh, Section 12304, that would uh, even increase, uh, uh, add another authority to access the Guard and Reserve. Another factor is policy, you know, inside, inside the building. We have a lot of policies that were <coughs> that were uh, in place during the Cold War and have not uh, migrated or changed to the point that allows easy access to the Guard and Reserve. That, that <laughs> the example that I can think of is Haiti, where uh, there was a feeling in the building that uh, we, we have to give Guardsmen and Reservists 30 days notice to respond to uh, an event like Haiti. And we're kind of shaking our heads. Uh, you know, 
we do this on a moment's notice uh, inside the United States, and we had guard units ready to go on a moment's notice to help Haiti. But because of self-imposed policy, uh, we were prevented from getting into the, into the fight uh, early. So we've got to take a look at policies. And then you've got to think about uh, resourcing because in, in the Air Guard, we, we uh, really have the blessing of the United States Air Force to be resourced uh, in the baseline for enough money to organize, train, and equip to, to the point that uh, we're ready to step out the door on the same timelines as the active component. If you look at our doc statements, our description of capability statements that uh, set the standard for not only levels of training but uh, the speed with it within which we have to get a fighter unit, say, or, or a lift unit uh, out the door. Uh, they're the same time standards as the active component. We train at the same levels, and we're able to do that because the Air Force has adequately funded us to get us up to that level. But we don't have a budget for any operations, and so what we, we need to rely upon and stress to the active component is you, you need to have some uh, MPA days, some military personnel authorization monies and resources there so when you need the guard, uh, it's not a, a matter of us having, having to, to spend time training up or ready to go, uh, but you need to program. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, oh, we, we've seen the enemy uh, uh, and, and the enemy is, is a failure to plan for enough MPA days to allow immediate access to, to the Guard and Reserve. And I think we have uh, turned the corner on that. I think you'll perhaps see a, a press release from the Chief of Staff uh, here pretty soon that uh, talks to the access problem and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force will tell you that there is no access problem as far as getting to the Air National Guard. I'd, I'd say from the Army perspective, uh, many of the same things that uh, General Wyatt uh, discussed. i just add that uh, the way that the Army and Air Force utilize their reserve components is a little bit different. Uh, very strong volunteerism in the, the Air National Guard and Air Reserve. But uh, the Army has to have uh, units. We generate uh, readiness by units. Uh, so you want that unit that's been training, manned, equipped, and, and led as a, as a capability, and you need all of them in order to get the capability that comes along with the organization. Uh, so uh, the Army <coughs> leans very heavily towards uh, when we need a capability in voluntary uh, mobilization. Now, uh, with uh, named uh, missions, named operations, and a, a mobilization authority comes with it, I don't think there's any argument about the access. Uh, we've not turned one mission down, and when the Army said we need this capability, uh, we've recommended and uh, they've selected, and we've sent that unit uh, off to war or to other missions uh, around the world. I think what, what comes into to play are those unnamed missions or those that pop up. Haiti was mentioned by, by General Wyatt. We had something very similar. We had units that were ready to go. Uh, but what was the authority, and do we have to give them 30 days notice? And if the United States Army is going to invest in a capability in the reserve components and they have a emergency operation such as Haiti, uh, they want to be assured that if they've invested there and that's a capability they're counting on, that they can have access, access to it um, in those types of, of cases, and I think the authority that General Wyatt said, uh, we support that, and, and we think that will answer uh, that requirement. Thank you. Okay. Just to kind of touch on what uh, General Cadavy said, uh, as an example of uh, the volunteerism in the Air National Guard, last year uh, we answered uh, close to 57,000 uh, requests for personnel, some, you know, a day or, or two at a time, some you know, where you would count one if it was a 365-day uh, MPA order. Uh, of that 50, close to 57,000, 89.5 percent were filled with volunteerism uh, out of the Air National Guard. Uh, Operation Odyssey Dawn happened in March, and if you've ever heard uh, General Johns or uh, former Transcom Commander General McNabb talk about March Madness and the stress on the mobility fleet worldwide, uh, when Odyssey Dawn popped, uh, there was a difficulty in, in getting enough tanker support for not only American forces but for the coalition forces. They asked the Guard. There was no mobilization authority for Odyssey Dawn. They asked the Guard to uh, participate. We provided 14 of the 22 air refueling tails from 11 different states. Uh, the Air Expeditionary Refueling Unit was commanded by Brigadier General Roy Updegraff, a Pennsylvania Air National Guardsman. No mobilization authority. Six months long, we were in theater. 100% volunteerism. So there's no access problem 
uh, to get to the Air National Guard. I think you're probably starting to get the impression that, that we are an integrated force. This National Guard that's almost a half a million people out there has been brought in and we are, we are tightly wound with our services. Therefore, we need to be used. And that's our argument here. Keep us, keep us operational. Keep us balanced. Don't take the guard, in our case, down to a point where we're unusable again. And if they can, and I think Secretary Panetta gets it and, and Marty Dempsey gets it, and so do the other service chiefs. There's got to be a sweet spot here. There's got to be a balance. Why would we squander this investment that 10 years of, of integration has brought us to? I think that's the, that's the debate. That's where we are. That's why we're strongly urging um, the services and, and, our, and our supporters to say, let's get this right for America. It's good for everybody. And uh, that's kind of where our emotion is and that's where our emphasis is. And hopefully as we go through the, the budget lay down in February, we'll find that, th that, that this has resonated. Hey, I'm Sherman Patrick with Senator Chris Coons. Um, next year, coming up in the Senate, we've heard that they're going to be addressing cybersecurity in particular. We in Delaware have been very impressed with what our Guard has done on cybersecurity. We think it's a great mission. But my question is going forward, looking at the, uh, the structure of 2020, what's the right balance between new missions like cyber and traditional missions like airlift? Well, we've built our uh, structures around actually Cold War constructs. And so if we're going to break into these new uh, areas of opportunity and, and necessity for our nation, we're going to have to break down the Cold War manning structures that our Air Force and our Army have us uh, uh, bend in. And, and I would say both the Air Force and the Army understand we have capabilities, we have civilian acquired skills in all of our nation's National Guard that could be used in the capacity in which you referred, cyber for example. Um, rather than go out and create little niche missions, uh, which is kind of where we are today, uh, I want to work with General Alexander and contribute Army Guardsmen and Air Guardsmen to his force so that we can utilize uh, the most competent, the most skilled people we can out in the field. That's our next step, and, and, and General Alexander and I have got great uh, communication lines open, and we need to do that. But everybody needs to participate in this. Um, we don't need to have a, a cyber Pearl Harbor to discover that we need to prepare and plan for this. And, and I thank you for that question, because in Delaware, for example, with your high-tech corridors, it's really important uh, with your Adjutant General Frank Vavil and your governor to make sure we do involve all the members of the National Guard. Uh, if, if the Air Force portfolio was a stock market, I would invest in cyber and RPA uh, because that's what I, where I see the shift coming. The, the Air National Guard and I think the Air Force to a large extent is shifting from a platform-based uh, construct of the past to a capabilities-based uh, force. Of our 106,700 Air National Guardsmen right now, uh, close to 9,000 are already involved in, in cyber. Uh, on the RPA part of it, we fly about 20% of uh, all the, the, uh, the combat air patrols uh, for, uh, for the Air Force. Uh, but cyber, I think, offers perhaps the even great, greater opportunity because if you think about what a cyber warrior does and how uh, proficient the cyber warrior needs to be, you find most of the proficiency in the civilian communities uh, trained by some of the companies that reside in, in the exact area that you're talking about. We have identified uh, what we call centers of excellence around the country that provide uh, the demographics uh, for building uh, a cyber force uh, in our local communities through Air National Guard units. And so what we're doing is in those areas like Delaware, like Washington State, like Silicon Valley, like Austin, Texas, and there are some others, not to leave anybody out, uh, we are uh, standing up our uh, cyber forces uh, in the states in those particular areas, working with 24th Air Force for presentation of the forces to General Alexander, uh, uh, trying to become a part of the way ahead uh, that the Air Force sees for, uh, for cyber. Uh, if you think about the individuals that we're talking about, whether they come into the Air Force uh, right out of high school or college and go into the cyber 
world and are trained uh, militarily in the cyber world, eventually they get to, whether it's a four-year or six-year point, the end of their enlistment. And there's no way that the military can compete with <coughs> the civilian salaries that these skilled warriors have. And so rather than lose them forever to the military, we think the niche for the Air National Guard is to provide uh, units uh, in those loca locales where they will probably work in their civilian life using those same skills, let them make the high dollars in the, in the civilian workforce, but on drill weekend, two weeks in the summer, maybe even whenever they want to, come to work for the Air National Guard and be challenged in some areas that you won't be challenged with in your civilian community. We've already seen that. We've got a, uh, a cyber warrior in Washington State that on drill weekend, on his own dime, flies to the East Coast to, to Fort Meade to do battle with uh, folks uh, worldwide. Uh, and that's what we think we can, we can offer. We can capture some of that talent that's trained in the Air Force and not let it separate, but rather transition to further service to the country. In the Army Guard, our current effort is, is limited uh, to individuals uh, with the skill sets that they acquired through, through civilian training and is the need or the requirement to, is generated and we find an individual that fits that, is willing to volunteer, uh, they mobilize individually and they go and help uh, specific cyber headquarters uh, in, in their mission. Uh, we also have individuals uh, that are assigned uh, to the cyber commands, both Army and in joint uh, in the future as we identify what the Army's structural support will be. Uh, we definitely would, would want to be a part of it as we are with every other uh, capability that the Army has. Um, we play in it and so we, we definitely would want to uh, have some cyber organizations if that's where the, the United States Army uh, goes. Ray Dubois, CSIS. Clearly the pressure on the defense top line and the drawdowns in Afghanistan and Iraq are gonna lead to reductions in end strength. I wonder if the three of you, based on some of the comments you've made already, might share with us uh, some specifics to it. The balance between the active components and the reserve components and the drawdowns that we will face on the air staff, what have been the discussions with respect to that balance? On the Army staff, we've heard uh, discussions that perhaps some heavy formations would move from the active component to the reserve component. Uh, there have been other discussions about the national reserve components ought to maintain their level of end strength while the active components reduce. Uh, I'd, so I'm interested both in terms of the air staff and the Army staff discussions and also in the tank with you, Craig, in terms of the Joint Chiefs, the corporate chiefs talking about this in the macro sense. I, I think <clears throat> former Secretary Gates and, and, and now Secretary Panetta have pretty much outlined their priorities. Uh, they're seeking savings in, in four or five bins and, and force structure is not uh, – uh, yet at, at an appropriate place where we can discuss it uh, meaningfully um, because of some of the issues that are being uh, deliberated in the very small groups in the Pentagon. But um, I think our, our case is to present the National Guard uh, force presentation to be considered as, as, a, as a force uh, to rely on, a, as a force that is competent and capable and that if integrated properly can be a significant uh, advantage uh, during a fiscal uh, constrained environment. That, those, are the, the, those are the themes that we're following. I'll let General Wyatt and General Cadby talk about the specific Army uh, and Air Force pieces because they're different. And, and the service chiefs, quite frankly, are each taking a little different angle on what contribution that their reserve components will make uh, to a force structure that has a $450 billion uh, reduction. That's where we are today, $450 plus uh, billion dollar reduction. The Secretary has articulated that. So, so what part of that will the Air Force and the Army take? But each service chief has their own unique way of doing it. What I can tell you is um, we're very much at the tables to discuss it. 
We're very much being heard. Uh, alternative strategies are being discussed. And I kind of think that's, that's progress from where we were 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, back when things were kind of uh, divisive and we had off-sites where people came to town and we had to have you know, some pretty serious discussions, we, we certainly aren't there yet. And we're able to put our equities on the table so far. Um, where we go from here uh, with the super committee and, and, and potentially sequestration and things like that, uh, time will tell. But I'll let Bud and, and uh, Tim talk about their services because I think that's what your, your question really zeroes in on. Uh, I, I think, and let, let me maybe address the question in a couple of, of uh, fashions, uh, uh, the Air Force overall and then some of the uh, internal uh, ways that we build units a little bit differently than the, than the Army does. Uh, Air Force as a whole, uh, and I will tell you what, has, uh, what General Schwartz has said about the Air Force as it goes forward. Uh, he's made the statement that the Air Force will get smaller in strength and that we will get smaller across all three of the components. Uh, he spoke to the uh, uh, General McKinley's uh, Joint Senior Leadership Conference of the National Guard last week and advised us that uh, it, it looked like there would be a not only a downsizing of all three of the components, but a shift of the percentages of uh, combat air forces uh, from the Guard to the active component, and a shift in the percentages of tails in the MAF from the Guard to the active component. Now, you can agree or disagree with uh, the General, but that's the direction that I've been, uh, I've been given. Uh, the discussions continue. Uh, uh, we don't know what the final sh force shaping is going to be, uh, depending upon the size of the budget. So that decision could change as we go forward, depending upon how big the budget bogey is. Uh, to tie that back into the previous question, if those percentage shifts in the CAF and the MAF do take place, I look at it as opportunities to maybe shift some of our force st structure that remains, uh, what what, uh, what parts of it do remain, to some emerging missions like RPA, like uh, cyber, uh, like some of those uh, mission sets, Red Horse, uh, the engineering, the medical, uh, the comm, some of the things that uh, serve our governors very well. So I don't necessarily look at it as a bad thing. I look at it as a challenge and, and an opportunity. But the discussions continue. Inside the Air Force, uh, when we talk about ACRC mix, we, we sometimes talk about not necessarily the overall shift of the percentages of CAF, MAF, force structure, or uh, you know who's getting smaller and who's getting larger, but we talk about the way we put our units together. We have associations a lot of times. Uh, you know, Historically, we've had an Air National Guard unit and a reserve unit and an active duty unit, and now we, we find there is great efficiencies to leverage the strength of the three components into things called associations. We have active associations where most of the the physical equipment is owned by the Air National Guard, but the active duty has a contingent that comes in, operates out of the same location, and is part of that unit. Classic association go the other way, where the, where the iron, if you will, is owned by the active component, and the Guard of the Reserve falls in, like a Langley F-22 unit, where the Air Guard 92nd uh, Fighter Wing is part of the, of the first uh, uh, fighter wing. Uh, so we, we are looking at that, in, uh, the total force enterprise, inside uh, the Air Force. I think the thing that, that challenges all of the services uh, is uh, to, first of all, recognize that whenever there are outside pressures, either from you know, emergencies or financial crisis, uh, all of us uh, have a tendency to, uh, not consciously, but uh, just as a, a natural reaction, uh, uh, go back to organi organizational bias. Go back to those things that were comfortable to us when there wasn't these pressures go back to the comfortable institutions, go back to the comfortable way of doing business like we've always done. If we let organizational bias across the services, across DOD uh, affect us in the future, then we will lose some opportunities to transition in the future. I think that's the challenge, not necessarily the ACRC mix, but the challenge of uh, getting away from organizational bias and thinking of new ways to do business, <coughs> new constructs to do business. Well, I'll start off by saying that uh, there's a lot of thought, a lot of analysis, and a lot of discussion going on as to what the United States Army should look like, and we're focusing on the year uh, 
2020. Uh, the good news is, is that all three components of the Army, the active, the Guard and Reserve, are committed to giving this, this nation the Army it needs and deserves. Uh, with that said, uh, we're looking at the right balance and the right mix between the three components and within combat arms, combat support, and combat uh, service support. Um, there are no decisions. Uh, as I said, the analysis and discussion is ongoing. Uh, as far as uh, heavy BCTs, heavy force in the Army National Guard, we already have seven heavy BCTs and one striker brigade. So we understand um, how difficult it is and the energy and resources it requires uh, to train, manage, uh, equip, and lead those type of organizations. And, and we'll, we'll support the Army in wherever it, uh, direction it needs to go. And just my final comment, everybody's been in here during downturns in the economy and, uh, and fiscal challenges. And so do we, do we let the budget drive the strategy or the strategy drive the budget? I, I'm very impressed with General Dempsey's approach to trying to articulate the strategy, uh, to take that all the way uh, to the White House and, and to get the President's opinion and views and guidance. And then once that's set, I think over the next 90 days, and a lot of things can happen in the next week, for example. We may be back at the drawing tables uh, this time next week uh, if other conditions present themselves. So too early to tell you, but I'm, I'm confident as a chief and, and, and our, as our two services that we're in there uh, with, uh, with our services trying to articulate what we can provide. And this 2020 military is a big deal. I think we all need to pay attention to it. Uh, what the nation has in 2020 will define the, the decade that's out there. And as the president has said, it's going to be a shift toward the Pacific. And so uh, much of you, many of you in this room understand that maybe better than we do. Uh, but, but it's definitely a shift in focus. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of an exciting time in our nation's military. Uh, turbulent, but exciting. Chief, it is all of that. And you're in the middle of it. As we know, there is a debate going on in the Hill today that there might be people calling you soon. I know there's a DMAG meeting with this, the, uh, the deputy and the vice chairman, and I think a tank meeting all today. So we are very appreciative of your taking the time from your schedule. Certainly, General Wyatt, General Cadavy, you're also coming here to enhance the, enrich the conversation. On behalf of CSI, just let me thank you so much for taking the time to be with us to share your thoughts. and. Uh, we wish you the best in the, in the future. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you all. For your